Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Surge Podcast. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I had to take a break. Uh, I apologize. Uh, it wasn't really a break. It's just the fact that given my schedule, I pre-record a lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of the content that I put up. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I decided to delay some of the episodes that I had pre-recorded because I felt it hit way too close to home. It was supposed to be a whole series on uh, mass casualties, disaster planning, and disaster training, a sort of three-parter. Uh, but I felt that it hit too close to home with uh, what happened in Lebanon. My heart goes out. Um, I encourage everybody to make donations where they can. And uh, I hope that all of my Lebanese friends are staying safe and doing well. It's an unfortunate circumstance, and no words uh, can express um, how everybody feels about the situation. It really was a, a scary sight to see. So um, that's why I didn't put them out, because I really felt that it had too close to home to talk about this type of thing, where, where things are overwhelmed. And I've decided to delay it for a while, so um, you know, expect that, that it'll be out soon, just not um, right now. Uh, for today's episode, I wanted to talk about whether or not we as physicians can forget our skills after a period of time uh, not working. Uh, because, and this is particularly true in surgery or in, in procedural specialties, I, I should say, uh, there's this uh, thought that you can forget your skills or that uh, if you don't practice for, say, a year or so or two years, um, you are you're, you lose your hands, quote unquote. Um, I can't. I, I, I can't see how that can happen, and I'll explain why in a second. I really can't see how you can let that happen uh, if you enjoy your specialty and if you know what you're doing. And, uh, you know, the topic came up in conversation at work uh, because I've had to uh, convert the bulk of my practice to mainly doing COVID ICU work, which, you know, I'm very uh, proud of and I find quite interesting. Um, so I, 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 all I do is work in a COVID ICU these days. Um, I'll cover between uh, 7 and 14 days on call straight, and it's what has to be done at this moment in time. And uh, somebody raised some concerns at work that um, I wasn't operating and what, what I would do when I start operating again. Now, for me personally, I understand what he means or she means. It, they mean skill decay. That's the technical term for it. And skill decay does occur. It is a real thing. But it doesn't occur in all skills, and certainly doesn't occur in the manner that the people presume. And if, if it was a comment made as a comparison, um, most surgeons around the world have had to cut down their practice because of COVID-19. I'm not the only one. I'm just lucky enough to have a specialty in which I'll always have something going on. You know, you'll always need an intensivist and you'll always need a surgeon and you'll always need a trauma surgeon somewhere in, in, in the sphere of things. This, this is a skill set that, that keeps you busy. And I think that uh, it's mainly propagated amongst surgeons, but I really do think that everybody says that, that they feel that uh, they'll lose their skills if they don't operate. And that is true to an extent. Skill decay is real. But it's not as real as uh, certain quotes that you see here and there, like a quote from Sir Astley uh, Cooper, who was a very famous surgeon. It said that if he doesn't operate for a week, his assistants notice, and if he doesn't operate for a month, even the operating room technician. Uh, which were to take note of a subdued skill. I can't see that, right? Um, I, I don't see how how not operating for a week uh, could possibly make you forget how to operate. And I'll explain why in a second. Number one, you'll have to accept that if you are practicing medicine in 2020, 2021, in our era, it's a fact of life that you will have to limit your practice for a certain period of time. When you're a resident, you'll limit your practice during your electives that may not have anything to do with your primary specialty for two to three months at a time. You may also need to limit them as part of your research. A lot of people take a research year off or do research fellowships, and it's just as important as your clinical practices. And I don't see them as different things. I'm just saying that dedicating some time to research is always a good thing. Doing rotations outside your primary specialty or concern. If you have health issues, God forbid, and it's a fact of life. You know, you have a new member of the family, so you need to take paternity or maternity leave. You will be taking a couple of months off of your practice. I hate to break it to you, but we're all going to take two or three months where we're not operating or not in the resuscitation room or uh, not in the ICU. We're going to take whole years off. 
you know, it just happens. Even for administrative purposes, if you're establishing a new department or a new concern, you're going to stop doing your old work. You're going to change your practice. And it's a fact of life. And so therefore, rather than having a concern of whether or not the skills decay, have a plan so that they don't decay. And there is some science behind skill decay. You can technically lose certain skills, but it depends on your definition of skill. Now, the most appropriate definition I found is that a skill is an ability to perform a task or action with an acceptable level of outcome and energy. So you're not tired at the end of it. It has to be learned and therefore involves d different degrees of mastery and can in some cases deteriorate. And the reason why I say that is because the first thing you need to understand is there's a hierarchy in the development of skills from being a student to an apprentice to a specialist to an expert and a craftsman. And that's sort of why I like to have belt levels in my head when I'm assessing people. Because the belt levels mirror this. Belt levels in martial arts pretty much mirrors your hierarchy of skills, right? I would contend that at an expert level, you're not going to forget much, right? But you might be outdated, and that's a different thing. And the reason why I would contend that is because it's been studied. For most of healthcare, there are multiple skills that are required. But there's a technical skill set, a tactical skill set, and strategy. The technical skill set is what you can do with your hands. It's what you have to learn procedurally and involves the motor cortex. The tactical skill set is your cognitive approach, your mental mindset, right? And they're synergistic in the way that they work. But I would say a tactical skill set is, is probably more cognitive. And then there's the strategic skill set. Now, strategy overall occurs everywhere in medicine, including the operating room. I know that some people have an impression that surgeons don't really think. We kind of do, but we think in far more definitive terms in general. When I'm wearing my surgeon's hat, it's a lot more uh, objective and binary and clear cut. And examples of technical skills in different specialties that I know of, at least and interact with on a regular basis, are technical skills of using an ultrasound, intubating central lines, uh, same thing with ER, same thing with anesthesia, uh, including, of course, nerve blocks, uh, in surgery, suturing, knot tying, endoscopy, and anastomosis. Uh, tactical skill sets uh, typically in ICU include the ability to assess fluids, your approach to shock states, your decisions to intubate and extubate, your nutritional assessment. Uh, in the ER, it's usually, and these are only examples, these aren't all encompassing uh, definitions of the discipline, so don't take it to heart. Rapid EKG interpretation, which no surgeon ever knows how to do, some would argue, myself included. Um, that was a joke. Uh, decisions for toxidromes uh, without full clinical pictures, rapid decision making, uh, often life saving. Decisions in surgery are resection margins, uh, surgical approaches, and in anesthesia, it's pain management, perioperative risk assessment, and perioperative medication control, as well as the conduct of the operating room. And that reflects in the strategies that these disciplines bring to the table. So, in the ICU, the strategy is to provide either an advanced resuscitation maneuver that's prolonged over hours or optimal supportive care. In the ER, it's an aggressive rapid resuscitation and optimal patient flow. That's, that's the overall strategy in the ER. You want to have an active, constant movement of patients towards a trajectory. In surgery, it's to provide safe management for pathologies which require your specific surgical expertise. And in anesthesia, it's to be that support that the patient needs throughout their journey through a very difficult time getting a procedure and through their pain. And, you know, the strategies, the tactical and the technical, all have different parts of the brain that they use in general, neurologically. And, and you know, I would say one thing that you'd notice when you look at this um, table is technical skills take a long time to learn. Everybody who's been through these rotations knows that technical skills are the hardest things that you're going to have to learn, right? Tactical skills can be learned very quickly. Tactical skills can be learned very quickly. All it takes is changing the way that you think and believing the evidence that's put forward in front of you and, and trusting the, the knowledge base that you have. Strategy oftentimes requires a lot more cognitive load and is a lot more implicit. As is technical skill to a constant because, and I say this again, this is only an example, because technical skills are procedural. And procedural things like uh, playing an instrument, riding a bike, uh, making an omelet, they don't really require 
innate active thinking. They, they, they're almost autonomous, you know, in a way. And that's one of the terms that they use for, for craftsman level skills. It's, it's that it becomes almost autonomous, where you can do it without thinking and add to another creative layer to it. And they're usually stored in the motor cortex, right? Tactical skills are cognitive and multifocal. They rely on different types of memory at different times. Things like planning your exercise program, picking your groceries. That requires some time to be invested. That requires some thought process, right? And I would contend that the first time that you've picked certain groceries and you've forgotten something, you learn how to write a good list. You don't need to make the mistake once. And, and they're the easiest to fix. But the problem is that they're scattered all over the place. They use multiple areas of the brain. And strategy, things like career planning, are also cognitive and multifocal, but they require a lot more of a nuanced thought process, a lot more brewing. And in fact, this is just an fMRI of the brain. When you look at procedural skills, your brain changes the more you do them. And they require less and less brain activity as they get stored within the motor cortex, as you hit craftsman level. And that's where procedural memory starts to kick in. It's, it's an expert to craftsman level. And that's where it becomes autonomic. And I would contend that, in general, once it's in your procedural memory, you're not going to forget it. So be aware that a surgeon's not going to forget how to tie a knot. They're not going to forget how to make an anastomosis. They're not going to forget how to dissect out a colon. But that doesn't mean that they're going to have the same decision-making process if they take a year off. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The tactical can fade, but the technical not so much in theory. And there is some evidence in medicine, but the evidence is a little bit on the weaker side. It's a, it's a bit of a runny egg. You know, first things first, just to prove the point that procedural memory never fades, skill decay does not happen with tourniquet use. When you train people to put on tourniquets, you wait for six months, you ask them to put on a tourniquet, they know how to do it in six months' time because it's a very procedural skill. However, when you ask people about their perceptions of their colleagues and their residents, when it comes to these same procedural skills, their perception seems to be biased or skewed. And I'm not saying that there's bias in this paper. I'm saying that this paper shows that there's a perception that if you take time off, you're going to be worse at doing certain skills that are required, especially if you take time off for research. And the sad fact is that these studies aren't being done with fully trained, fully certified experts in emergency medicine, surgery, anesthesia, ICU. They're being done with people at resident level in their second to third year of training, so they're not experts yet, or even with medical students like this paper. And they reflect, number one, a perception, number two, less expertise. And when you look at the factors that influence skill decay and retention, and I, I think everybody should read this paper. It's a fairly old paper, but it explains the topic very well. Technical skills do not get lost. Procedural skills do not get lost. You do not forget them. However, you can, if you're not up to date with the guidelines and you're not up to date with the literature, you can have a weakness in your decision-making process and your mindset. And so mental training becomes the problem. Also, in order to reduce your loss of the tactical skill set that you need, it would be better to have spaced out training and spaced out times when you update yourself. The way that the cognitive, the way that the training works is it seems that the cognitive training is just as good as the simulation training for temporarily non-performing surgeons in general. Now, this is an orthopedics paper, but that doesn't mean that orthopedic surgery is less technical or more technical. It's just an example for surgical discipline. And to be honest with you, the surgeons have spent a lot more time studying this than most other disciplines. Um, the obstetricians have also spent some time studying this, and uh, apparently during the pandemic, people have been giving out laparoscopic trainers at home, and they seem to have had better skill retention in the group that, that, got, that got the laparoscopic trainers. Cognitive training seems to be key. If you're going to take time off, you're going to have to work on your cognitive training. So you're going to have to do some exercises where you're attending rounds, even if it's telemedicine attendance of rounds, or where you're uh, reading the journals, or where you're going to webinars, or you're going to conferences. And you should space out these sessions so that there's always something going through your head, so that you keep the, the, the multifocal areas of your brain, the, the tactical areas of your brain, 
where your tactical skill set lives, you should keep things moving through that. And even with randomized data, it's been found on uh, mainly anesthesia skills like central line insertion, intubation, etc. You will retain more if you space out the training and if you provide procedural training with feedback. So if you have feedback from your colleagues and where there's a cumulative sum paradigm and there's some proficiency monitoring while you're doing the procedure, you are far more likely to have skill retention over time, especially at expert level. Now, the people who have studied this the most have been the military. And it's very interesting what they found. What they found was that skill decay is not very quantifiable. You can't predict when it's going to happen. Like, it's not going to be, oh, you didn't operate for a year, so you need to be supervised for the next two years. It's going to be more like, well, he's not bad. He came back and he's not bad. He's actually just as good as he was before. Or things haven't changed. Or it's going to be, oh, you know, well, why did it take you so long to decide to get blood? You know, it, it will be something that you'll pick up on, but it won't be something that you can objectively quantify necessarily. And I think that that's because there's a variation in the skills that you need within a certain discipline. And they looked at, this is not pure military data. This is military medical data. So these are medical procedures in the military. And they looked at how they're going to assess them. And there is no clear-cut big assessment model. For, for or prediction model for when you're going to lose a skill, right? But there are certain things that they identified are associated with prevention of surgical skill decay. First, they identified that there is a, a curve, a forgetting curve, just like there's a learning curve. And what you see here is um, how much you forget based on different levels of expertise. Where the most dotted line is the, the highest level of expertise, sort of craftsman level, if you will. And the non-dotted line is the beginner level of expertise. And you can see that beginners forget within six days. And it's the same with medical students, right? When we teach them suturing for a week, and then we don't work on it with them for a year, and we come to the exams, and they're, they're at their OSCEs, and they try and suture, you can tell that they haven't done this in a while. And you can tell that they just have not retained that skill, despite practicing it earlier in the year. Similarly, somebody who does a month of GI as a surgeon doing six or seven scopes is not going to retain that skill as much as somebody who does the six and seven scopes and then does uh, three months of bariatrics afterwards where he's scoping routinely every day. Um, they're going to retain their scoping skill set much, much, much better as residents, right? Now, you talk to somebody who's been an attending for 15 years and he takes two years off for sabbatical leave or something or whatever, uh, decides to go get a, an MBA and comes back, that person's been operating for a very long time. Those skills are now embedded. They are innate. They're procedural. All that person really needs is a couple of workshops to see what the new indications and guidelines are, a little bit of up-to-dating, and he should be or she should be up and running, right? And there are factors that they identify for military data. Now, you have to understand, like I said, the quality of these studies is a little bit sketch, right? They're not perfect studies, but, you know, and they're explorative mainly at this point because this is a relatively new thing. We haven't been good at identifying or quantifying it. Number one, the, the length of the non-use interval. Number two, the degree of overlearning, how much you have learned beyond your level of mastery. So how much new things you're learning all the time. Number three, it's the task characteristics. The level of complexity makes it harder for you to retain it. The more complex the task is, the harder it is for you to retain it. Number four, the original method of assessment acquisition and retention, i.e. the type of tests that were done, and what was emphasized during your training, right? If, if certain things were emphasized more than other things, then you, you will likely retain the things that were emphasized during your training. It sounds obvious, but people don't understand that. If I scream at you, don't let go of the guide wire, the first thing that you're going to remember when you're doing a uh, central line insertion is to not let go of the guide wire. But you're going to forget to use the dilator, maybe. If I only assess one part of, 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 of your, your skill set while you're in training, and if I'm not assessing every single part of that skill set, you're not going to retain that skill set necessarily completely. You're only going to retain the parts that, that I emphasize, right? And the way that you're taught and the strategies employed in teaching you and individual differences, obviously. Some people are naturally good at playing the piano. Some people aren't, as well as your motivation. So 
I would say that if you're taking a break because of COVID-19 from surgery, from whatever else that you do, and uh, you're like me, um, number one, be courteous. Do not criticize people who are on break. Uh, don't tell them that they don't know what they're doing because there's no science behind what you're saying or that they've forgotten how to do their job because there is very little science, especially if they're in attending and especially if it's at a meeting. Yeah, there's very little science for you saying that they forgot how to operate. And it's very rare for a surgeon to forget how to operate. I don't think I've ever heard of a surgeon who's forgotten how to operate. Number two, keep practicing. Keep reading. Make sure that you read up on your field. So I, I like to read all the surgical journals. Journal of Trauma is always somewhere there on my phone. Attend meetings and interact with your crowd. Interact with your tribe. Make sure that, that you know you keep uh, ahead of, of interesting cases that are happening around you, things like that. Invest in a task trainer. You can get them on Amazon. I might do an episode on mine. I bought it off of Amazon. I use it like once a week on the weekends. It's great. And stay confident and motivated. N know that you're going to go back to whatever you, weren't, you aren't doing right now. You're, you're definitely, don't make it into a question. Uh, make it into an objective. I'm definitely going to go back to running an elective surgical practice and running a trauma program and doing these things. And then practice your procedural memory. Learn other things that require your motor cortex and your procedural memory. So uh, take up cooking. Um, you know, do stuff like that. Do other things that require procedural memory use just to keep that pathway up and running and myelinated. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, and again, I apologize for the extended break. Uh, I also apologize that this is mainly surgically relevant, but that's the bulk of the literature. Uh, maybe some of uh, the listeners can look into if there are any papers from other disciplines. I'd be very interested to see it. And to be honest with you, a lot of this stuff is mostly studied with um, musicians. And I think that, that that's the perfect paradigm for, for physicians because musicians invest with a passion what they do. And I think that any good physician is going to invest with a passion with what they do. And it's very hard for somebody who's passionate at something to forget how to do it even if they take a break because your mind is constantly preoccupied with it. I'm Saud Al-Zaid. Uh, thank you for listening. And please like, comment, and subscribe.